Hi and Happy New Year to everyone. Welcome to Volume 4 of Retro Court. Here we are in the New Year 2005 and here we go with the first game of the year, Super Leicester for the Super Famicom. Of course we're bringing you the Japanese version as always because the American version is completely bastardized with another stupid name, Space Mega Force. And the European version has got a few levels missing. Mind you, so is the US version. So the Japanese version is the one to go for. Super Lester by uh, Toho and uh, Compile. Unfortunately, Compile have now disappeared. Which is a shame. You may know Compile from such games as um, Genshin and Lester on the Mega CD. Um, also very famous for the number one puzzle game, Puyo Puyo. But not many people recognize them for their classic shooters. And this one of their classic shooters is the best one they ever made. In my book anyway. Okay, so at the moment we've got uh, the laser weapon, and uh, one thing which this game does feature is different modes for each weapon. So at the moment, uh, I'll just power it up, so we've got three sets now. At the moment I'm just doing uh, straight blasts, with one flick of the button, and there you go, one turns into a homing missile, or, or homing laser I should say, which makes the game quite easy to play. One of the best things about Super Leicester is the massive uh, explosions which the game has. There we go, something's a blow up, it's the big boss guy. Welcome to hell. Actually, there is one improvement over the uh, Japanese version that the European and the US version have, and that's much more clear of a speech. The Japanese version has really muffled speech. Here we go, I've got my standard Vulcan weapon here. And at the moment it looks like a spider on heat going mad. We just change into a star formation. There's some sort of a cross formation there. And then another backwards firing crap. And back to a, another different formation. And your standard two-way blaster. And your maniac style. So as you can see, there are quite a variety of um, modes for your weapons to be in. Just too bad that guy wasn't around long enough to see them all. Now this is a complete and utter shite weapon. Basically, whichever way you've put yourself, that's the way the weapon flies. I see that little Diddy space station in the background spinning around. We'll be coming straight up to that in a minute. Thanks to the wonders of the Super Famicom's Mode 7. Oh, I've had it without my laser. Oh, this is quite a nice weapon. Power it up and let rip. Nice. There are actually a total of eight different weapons you can get in the game. Ranging from complete and utter crap to pretty useful. This is one of my favourites, this is the Sprite Weapon. Or better known as Option. So as you can see, they're all stuck in one formation at the moment. With the click of a button, they follow me around. Click of another button, and yeah, lock them again. This weapon's actually quite useful for some weapons, uh, for some levels, I should say. Not exactly the best weapon in the game, best weapon in the game being the laser, of course. But um, actually, I prefer this one than uh, most of the other weapons. As you can see, this weapon sort of rebounds um, bullets off anything you shoot. Oh, 
This is sort of more of a bonus level than actual area to see. see. Basically everything you blow up gives you a power up. Which can be very useful if you're running a bit low. It's also uh, got one of the songs in the background music which is missing out of the western versions. Just let it rip with a bit of an explosion there. Nice big meaty bomb. And another one. Go on, take that. One thing you might actually have noticed is this game just does not slow down. Everything moves, yet nothing slows down, which is amazing for a Super Famicom game. When you consider Konami's games such as Axley, um, the Prodis series, Gradius, or oh, fucking hell, Gradius, that slows down like a bike bitch. I think Compile have done a very, very good job in making this one game. Um, absolutely no slowdown whatsoever, and everything moves. Even if we just pause it here, See, even you can see the bullets even flash. Everything moves in this game. Here we come to one of my favorite bosses. Hey, hey, look sharp. Can't help but feel, um... Oh, shit. That he ripped it off a Thunder Force 4. On the levels of Thunder Force 4 there. And uh, I've just completely lost all my power there because I've been hit. So I'm in shit stream now. And a couple of bombs or so now it's... He didn't last long, did he? It's another one of my favourite bosses. A bit of a spider type boss. He throws like 500 tons of rock out here. Gotta try and kill him while uh, avoiding his arms and whatever. Yep, I think I'm in trouble here. If there was one thing I'd have to say about uh, Super Leicester, which was going to be a bad point, would be um, the fact that if you do actually get the laser weapon, which I've got now, it is actually quite easy to uh, get through the game. But the problem being is uh, if you lose your weapon, Especially if you're stuck with a shite weapon. Um, getting it powered up again can be quite an uphill struggle, especially on some of the more difficult levels. Luckily for the Western version, or for Western players I should say, um, a couple of the levels have been toned down, but this Japanese version has some rock hard uh, level settings, such as a Maniac and whatever, which can certainly test your playability skills. So graphically, as you can see, Super Leicester is a very, very nice game. The music on it as well, as well is also very nice. Some of my favourite music on the Super Famicom, to be honest. This level doesn't have to your eyes in though. <laughs> As you can see, uh, Compile is certainly not shy to uh, exploit the Super Famicom's uh, graphical capabilities. Lots of scaling and uh, Stretching and distortion of sprites. So basically, in this boss, he uh, spins around, comes up, points another uh, little pod at you. And out the pod comes a different type of weapon. Hey, 
Hey, what's this? Oh, it's the obligatory big ship level that most shooters had in the uh, late 90s. Not to mention in the late 80s as well. Whoop. So there you have it, that's a Super Leicester for the Super Famicom. Absolutely wonderful shooter. Really long levels. Lots of levels as well. I think it's around about 10 levels to be honest. I can't quite remember now. This is level 8 anyway. Oh shit, look at the weapon I've got now. Um, whoops. That's going to be an uphill struggle now. Anyway, back to the score, yeah. So yeah, Super Leicester. Super Famicom. A superb game. Worthy of anyone's purchase. But whatever you do, make sure you get the Japanese version. Or uh, push the American version. And whatever you do, don't run the game on a PAL machine. Because the PAL version of this game is so slow. Not to mention it's got the new whopping borders. So we're going to give uh, Super Lester from Compile the retro score. A retro core score of 9 out of 10, probably the highest uh, scoring game we've ever had on the show so far. Absolutely awesome shooter, well worth buying. Get it now. Drift for the PC Engine. Personal favourite classic Sega arcade of mine. This conversion by Asmic. But how does the big meaty beefy arcade compare uh, stand up on the uh, little tiny incy wincy 8 bit PC Engine? Well, as you can see graphically, mm, it's not bad, I guess. Yeah, it is running on an 8 bit machine. But how does it play? Uh, let's start it up and find out. Okay, first thing you'll notice, uh, which is different, is actual character select screen. So let's go, uh, where's my favourite gun? Oh, he's down there at the bottom, isn't he? Here we go. Okay, we got the arcade speech in there. Whoop! Oh fucking hell! And yep, as I've uh, just figured out uh, very quickly into the game, the controls are absolutely lost. To be fair, the original arcade version of Power Drift was a bit uh, tricky to control, but uh, this PC Engine version is very tricky to control. Almost uncontrollable, in fact. This engine version does feature all the arcade tracks and does have a uh, fairly decent renditions of the music, I guess. Um, and I suppose it does do a fairly decent attempt at recreating the arcade touch. Fortunately, the controls are pretty uh, bad on it. The main problem with the control is that it's quite unresponsive. Meaning that you can actually turn, uh, pressing the button to turn, and it just won't turn. Other problems which the game does have is uh, the fact, as you just saw then, is the fact that you can't actually see uh, down the road half the time due to the viewpoint given. See there, very difficult to see where I'm going. Uh, 
So there you have it, that's a power drift for the uh, PC engine. Unfortunately, not the best version out there, best version still belongs on the Sega Dreamcast. Closely followed with the uh, Sega Saturn version. So unfortunately for the poor PC engine, I'm going to have to give Power Drift a terrible score of 3 out of 10. Majorly let down by the fact that the controls are complete and utter shite. Thank you very much, Asmic. Yeah, I know. The intro said it was going to be Top Hunter. Unfortunately, after making the Top Hunter intro, I found out that I haven't got my Top Hunter cart. It would be typical, isn't it? So I said we're going to bring you Nails Luck, which I'm sure you're all allowed to see anyway. So this is the game that started off the craze, the very first Metal Slug, and what an excellent game it is. For its time the animation was uh, unbelievable, in fact it's still very good even to this day. The amount of detail in the game is very very nice. Not only is the animation very good, the sound effects are great, some great humour in there, and even a few little special effects as you can see down here, got the reflection in the water. Very nice indeed. Basically, the idea of the game is just get through it, blow the crap out of everything in sight, and uh, rescue the little Robertson Crusoe type guys. <coughs> and try not to get yourself blown up in the process. You want to shit up me. One very nice thing about Metal Slug, all the little touches. So I see, <laughs> just uh, spotted them with a big uh, rock there, and the bloody guts come flying out. Yeah, I thought you'd get me with that, did ya? One cool feature is that you can actually actually get into a vehicle such as this one. One of my favourite things about Metal Slug is the fact that you can actually use the backgrounds to aid you in your quest. Come on, give me some bonus you get. Nice. Go big boss time. Oh, got away from that. So it's actually quite hard to fault Metal Slug, to be honest. Um, of course, they be, they've improved on it in each and every sequel. But um, for the for the very first Metal Slug, there's not much you can uh, complain about. Okay, there's a little bit of slowdown in there every now and then when things get a bit busy. But um, overall, the game's just beautiful. So much attention to the details, you know. Oh, a little bit of square blood there. Oh my God, better press start. Oh, 
I would say uh, I did have to complain about something. Um, I don't know what it'd be actually. Uh, it could be that sometimes um, there's far too much going on, you sort of lose track of uh, what you're meant to be doing. But um, I wouldn't really say that's a fault of the game, to be honest. Just a fault of my uh, lack of concentration. I'd rather, be, I'd rather looking at the uh, pretty graphics. If you don't own a Neo Geo, you may be uh, interested in knowing that you can actually get Metal Slug for the Sega Saturn using the uh, RAM card. And it is actually quite a good conversion. Um, it does suffer from quite a bit of slowdown, like the Neo Geo does. But uh, overall, it's quite a good conversion, and uh, for half the price of the Neo Geo original, or less than half the price, you can't complain really. There you have it, one of the greatest uh, games for the Neo Geo when every other game on the machines are bloody beaten up. It's always nice to welcome something such as a uh, Metal Slug. A great addition to uh, any Neo Geo owner's collection, definitely. So Retro Core, very honoured to give uh, Metal Slug on the Neo Geo a beautiful score of 10 out of 10. Can't get any better. Sega Tone Cars for the Sega Saturn featuring Arcade Side and Saturn Side. Let's boot it up. Okay, originally when you start the game you don't have this many options, just I'm so good at the game and managed to get them all up. But then again I've got a big head. Anyway we've got Championship Mode, which is the same as the Arcade Mode. Exhibition Race, Special Track, Time Attack, Speaks for Itself. Versus Race, 2 player action. Uh, car setup, customize your cars, records, and options. One thing you'll notice in the options is it's set to bloody easy. I wonder why that is. Amount of laps you can have, boosts, damage on or off, and one of my favorites is the uh, CPU car, which you can actually uh, train to be a complete and utter bastard. But uh, we'll keep it on normal. One thing which uh, must be said about touring cars is the music. A lot of the music is uh, done by Sega's in-house. There's actually a special track by um, Richard Jackals of uh, Sega Europe, which has done a, a Sega Tone Cars remix of uh, Condition Reflex, which is actually from uh, which called Sega Rally. As you can see, absolutely no resemblance to Sega Rally so far. But I can assure you that uh, later on the song. It does sound a bit like Sega Rally. But um, I normally stick with the uh, music from uh, Avex Tracks, which is the Japanese uh, record label. So, let's kick up the game and see what it's like. So, first presentation wise, the game looks pretty much like the arcade. Got your car select screen here. So you got uh, your Mercedes, your Alfa Romeo, and your Toyota Supra. But I'm going to go with the uh, good old Opel here, tuned version. Then we'll go for automatic as well, make it a bit easier. So the game starts off with um, you having to uh, qualify for your course. 
So you have to do a qualifying lap, and um, of course, it's bloody impossible to get the top score on it. So it's going to be bullshit there. One thing that uh, many people complained about on touring cars was the actual hand handling of the car. Um, now, I don't know what those people are talking about. Obviously, they complain that the shit of the game, because the car controls very, very well. As you can see, I'm not having any problems controlling it. Whoops, a bit on the grass there. It's going too soon. Ah, shit. Oh, well. <laughs> Look at that, I made myself look like a complete ass there, didn't I? Anyway, a lot of people complained that the controls were a load of shit. But, um, actually, I think those people who did complain didn't actually sit down long enough to actually learn the controls. I think they were just expecting another Sega Rally or um, Daytona, you know, get in there, pick up the game, and off you go. When, in fact, Torn Cars isn't like that. you actually got to learn how to play the game. One of the major down points about Sega Touring Cars is the actual graphics. While they're very solid looking, and they are pretty close to the arcade, more than what Daytona was, the actual texture mapping on them is so low. You know, a lot of the textures do look as blocky as hell. The actual models themselves are quite nice, but the textures just make them look really ugly. Another downer is the frame rate. It's actually lower than the original Daytona was. I think we're talking about 20 frames per second, and even then, sometimes it drops. You know, slow down in a racing game is not really acceptable. Luckily for touring cars, it sort of makes up with it, with the uh, adrenaline pumping uh, playability. Which, believe me, once you learn the controls, it does come. One of the things about Tone Cars is that it actually fears, features a rear view mirror, which is um, quite unusual for a Sega racing game. Or quite unusual for a Saturn racing game, I should say. Another thing about Tone Cars is Sega didn't seem to give a shit about the music. Um, in this next song, uh, we got some guy saying, You fucking awake down there? No warning on the box. That's why we love Sega, isn't it? Just have a listen. That's right, you're fucking awake down there, everyone. I was actually quite surprised to find out that this conversion is actually done by CRI and not actually by Sega at all. CRI, as you might know, is responsible for the absolutely bollocks after Burner 3 on the Mega CD, the pretty substandard uh, Galaxy Force 2 on the Mega Drive, and, all, and a whole a shitload of other crap ports. But they are actually uh, the makers of. Um, the aero dancing games on the Dreamcast, which are actually quite nice. Unlike my player built skills at the moment, I'm going right off uh, here.
brick wall town. What a shit bricks town it should be called. Absolutely impossible to get around this course without hitting the wall. I guess that's why it's called brick wall town. This is probably one of the worst courses on the game as well for slowdown. Bloody hell, that's hard. So anyway, there you have it. Sega Tone Cars is the main game. Let's take a look at some of the extra options. So this is the exhi exhibition race in a Saturn mode. You've got your standard cars as before. But once you complete the normal game, you can actually get the um, Sega Proto, which is this one here. Oops, should get the tuned version. And this car is actually quite fast, and you actually get a new track to race it on as well. Boomtown Circuit. Very fast car. And actually, this car looks better than the actual um, main cars in the game, probably because it was designed specifically for the Sega Saturn version of Touring Cars. So anyway, there you have it, um, it's basically it really, for the Sega Saturn modes. Let's take a look at the arcade mode. So the arcade mode has a championship mode, expert mode, which is pretty much the same as a championship mode, but about five times harder. Grand Prix mode, which is a, or Grand Prix mode I should say, is um, quite nice, uh, lets you play for quite a long time as well. So in the Grand Prix mode, you have to choose uh, what's, which circuit you'd like to race on. You've got your standard three at first, your uh, country circuit, and so on. And then you have the extra round, which is actually uh, the special stage, which uh, I won't be actually able to show you because, uh, to be honest, I can't be asked playing it. I've got too many things to do, you see. So anyway, you select your course and you just race on it. I think I'll do something like 40 or 50 laps. There you go, 20 laps. I was mad as I wasn't I? Um, the thing is, though, the time limit is so tight on it that it's actually pretty much impossible to do when you first try it. Only after playing it for quite some time do you actually get the feel of the car. And then um, master all the corners. Unlike me here. Oh, far too wide. So there you have it, that's a uh, Sega Tone Cars for the uh, Sega Saturn, not the best Sega Saturn racer out there, but there are certainly a lot worse, and quite an actually, quite um, a nice attempt to port in the arcade to the Saturn. Can't help but feel if Sega did the port, it would have been a lot better though. But um, I suppose uh, we've got to be uh, thankful for what we got. So, by all means, don't buy this game if you've got to fork out a lot of money, but if you can find it cheap, buy it. So we're going to give a Sega Touring Cars a retro cost score of 7 out of 10. Would they got more? If the graphics though were a bit better and it didn't have that little bit of slowdown. But overall it's an entertaining enough game. Which I think um, most Saturn fans out there will be uh, quite happy to play.
Well, this is the very first um, Game Boy game featured here on Metro Core. And um, it's actually one of my favorites from um, Days Gone By, it's Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Follow the foot plan. Of course, these days it looks incredibly jerky. But uh, back in its time, it wasn't. So the idea of the game is get back April, the news reporter, instead of being kidnapped by the Foot Clan, or Shred, I should say. And it's up to our heroes, the Turtles, to get her back. But it's time, which was uh, 1990, I believe. It's 14 years ago now. Um, <clears throat> This is actually quite a nice game on the Game Boy. And you can see we've got a bit of parallax scrolling down there at the bottom. Ooh. It's extremely action packed. There's lots to um, see and do. And it's actually uh, quite a difficult game as well. It's definitely not a Game Boy game you'll be finishing within a couple hours of purchase. Audio is also quite nice for the Game Boy. And it's nice to see a Game Boy game where you can actually make out the characters instead of um, trying to guess what they actually are. The characters are nice and beefy on this game. Easy to make out what's what. Throughout the game you can find secret little uh, bonus games, such as this one. The idea of this one is to make sure you get the uh, last shurikin, or whatever they're really called. That mother brain, or whatever the fuck the idiot's called, get them all. Oh, and I lost. Oh well, nothing new there. Raphael's been captured. So between different levels you can actually choose different uh, turtles which you want to go. So we'll go uh, Michelangelo, the uh, nunchuck, um, nunchuck wheeling uh, turtle. As you, see, as you can see, the levels are quite varied, um, going through uh, different parts of the game. So we've been on the sewers, the streets, and now we're um, on the back of a load of trucks after kicking the shit out of Bebop. You can probably pick this game up for absolutely nothing these days, probably a couple of, couple of uh, pounds or whatever. And, um, I, uh, it's definitely a recommendation to anyone who's got a Game Boy and after a bit of a challenging uh, platformer. So we're going to give uh, Turtles Fall of the Foot Clan on the Game Boy. Actually, a pretty, pretty decent score of uh, 7 out of 10. It's not perfect, it does have a few issues, like um, sometimes foot soldiers can just sort of, sort of drop out of the sky and land on you. There's absolutely no way of avoiding the little solids. Um, also, there's a bit of a lack of a variety in the actual characters, but we'll put that down to our Game Boy memory restrictions. But overall, pretty good game though. I think um, if you've got a Game Boy, you should uh, seriously uh, think about getting.
Final Fight Special. Here we go with the Final Fight Special. Kicking it off is the Super Famicom version, or SNES version, which only has two characters. So uh, let's pick Cody. Okay, this is probably um, the version of Final Fight which most of you out there know about. Considered by most to be the best one. Of course, all those elite and star souls probably think it's the best as well. Mainly because those type of people never have a clue what to talk about anyway. Well, let's see, how can we say about the Super Famicom version? Well, we've got a bit of audio fault there. But overall, it looks pretty. Sounds better than the arcade version. And the arcade's got pretty awful audio. Colours are nice. Controls well. But it does have this pretty nasty bug in it, which I think all versions of Final Fight do have. Just watch this. Just keep the pee punching them. One of the major downers about the Super Famicom version is that it's actually missing half the levels of the uh, arcade version. The uh, factory level is gone, um, the bridge level is missing, also you can only choose two characters and it's only a one player game as well, which are all major downers. A point must be made out that uh, Capcom did actually release a second version of Final Fight for the Super Famicom, which featured Cody and uh, Guy. Well, actually no, it featured Guy and Hagar, I should say, or Hagar, whatever you want to call them. So unfortunately, the Super Famicom version is extremely scaled down compared to the arcade version. So, let's go and take a look at the Sharp X68000 version. Okay, X Sharp X68000 version, all characters available. So let's go Guy. One thing you'll notice straight away over this and the Super Famicom version is that it's a lot faster. It actually says to be the arcade. And you notice the phone booth wasn't there in the Super Famicom version. Also the colours in the Sharp X68000 version are a lot more closer to the original arcades. Audio wise the game doesn't sound as good as the Super Famicom. Uh, it sounds pretty much like the arcade version, which sounded like shit, really. But overall, it looks a hell of a lot better. The character's a bit smaller, though. Sharp X68000 version also features all the levels from the original arcade as well, which is uh, something that the Super Famicom doesn't. And you'll also notice in the top corner, you've got the uh, push start button, which uh, just tells you that it's a two player version as well, just like the original arcade. And 
there's something which isn't in the Super Famicom version. And these have their nice breasts showing. Which I'm sure a lot of you guys would love to be in the Super Famicom one. Okay, so there you have it, that's the x 68000 version. Let's check out the Mega CD version. Here we go, Mega CD version then. Again, all three characters. Let me go Guy again, he's my favourite. One thing you'll notice straight away is um, the audio on the Mega CD version is a million times better than all the other versions. Another thing you may notice is uh, the actual amount of colours used in the Mega CD version. It does actually uh, look quite bad compared to the uh, Super Famicom and the Sharps X68000 versions. Mainly due to the Mega Drive's color palette. But the game still runs at a good speed, just like the uh, Sharp X68000 version. All the speech is in there as well. Mega CD owners will be happy to know that all levels are featured from the arcade version, just like the Sharp. And also the Mega CD version features more characters on screen than any other version. Another nice bonus is uh, the Mega CD version actually has an extended introduction, which features a full-on speech and extras. An, interest, an interesting thing is that um, the Super Famicom and the Sharp X68000 versions of um, Final Fight were all programmed by Capcom themselves. Whereas this uh, Mega CD version was actually reprogrammed by Sega. It's like Capcom were enough for the job. But then again, most uh, Capcom games on the Mega Drive were reprogrammed by Sega, such as uh, Strider. Ghouls and ghosts and so on. Yeah. It's a nice little trick there. Actually, I think all versions of Final Fight suffer from that. <laughs> but it does come in handy for some of the later levels. So, there we have it. Three hot versions of Final Fight. Each fanboy for each machine considers his version the best. But, uh, which version truly is the best? Well, let me see. 
Well, the Super Famicom's got loads of levels missing. It's only got two players available. It's only a one-player game. It does have better music than the arcade machine. Um, it is a bit slower though. Uh, Graphic-wise, it does look nice. So then we got the Sharp X68000 version, which basically is the arcade machine. Not much difference there, really. So basically, you can't uh, fault it, really. And then you got the Mega CD version. While it moves nice and fast, yeah, it does have more characters on screen than any other version. Um, it's got better music than all versions put together, mainly due to the fact that it's from CD. Um, it's got all the levels in there. It's got an extended special intro. But the one thing that the Mega CD version is lacking in, and that's color. So, which one would you reckon is the best? Well, I'm going to have to say that the worst one is the Super Famicom version. Really much of piss poor effort there. But then again, it was one of the first games for the machine. Uh, the Shop X68000 is the arcade, so nothing special. So I'm going to actually say the best version of uh, Final Fight is going to be the Mega CD. Everything the arcade's got, except the colour, plus the extra bonus of a CD soundtrack and a nice new intro. So shall we save Guy? Ah, fuck him. Let him die. Here we have it, the uh, ultimate RPG for the Sega Mass System, Fantasy Star, the game that started the whole Fantasy Star series. Now you're probably wondering why the hell am I playing the Japanese version? Well the reason is, because the Japanese one sounds a hell of a lot better than the English one. Ok, you can hear the Japanese sound now, just wait till you hear the English one. Oh my ears! Yep, that's the sound from the English Mass System version. So now you can understand why I play the Japanese one. Anyway, back to the game. One thing the Fancy Star did uh, feature was these amazingly smooth 3D dungeons. Just a second, let's put it back to the Japanese version. Ah, that's better. So anyway, as I was saying, the uh, Mass System version of Fantasy Star featured these really nice 3D dungeons, which were actually going to feature in uh, Fantasy Star 4 and Mega Drive, but they took them out due to memory restrictions of the cartridge. The story in Fantasy Star is actually quite good for its time. Uh, it's a bit basic compared to uh, today's standards, but uh, back then it was actually something quite nice. For an 8-bit machine, it's graphically decent, nothing too special about it, but uh, it, looks, it looks the part. Just like any other RPG at the time, you have to go shopping to buy uh, stuff to aid you in your quest. You got your stats and so on. Now, is it just me, or do these guys look something like. Uh, oops, wrong button there. Do these guys look like the Stormtroopers or something from Star Wars? Pretty dodgy if you ask me. But 
So once you exit the village which you're in, you become a, you go to the main map, and of course down the main map you get to fight some baddies. And since I'm making the video, nobody, nobody, <laughs> no baddies are deciding to come. Yeah, really typical. Here's one. It's your typical uh, turn-based uh, affair. Oh, six gold pieces, not bad. So there you have it, fancy stuff in the mass system. Um, quite a nice RPG actually for the for the, for the machine. Um, definitely worth getting if you own a mass system, if you're into a bit of a nostalgic uh, RPG. -ing. But uh, compared to today's standards, like I said, it's uh, not up to much. But um, for this time, it was good. So we're going to give it a retro core score of 9 out of 10. Actually, very good RPG. Here we are outside the Famicom shop. It's a used game shop in um, Tobata in Kokura in Japan. And today we're going to have a video interview with the owner of the shop. As you can see, uh, it does look quite old from the outside, but inside it's full of goodies. So, uh, first, let's go and have a look around the shop. So as you can see over here, we have a cupboard of uh, hardware, quite a lot of goodies in there. And down here we got some uh, loose Famicom cartridges. And you can't have a Famicom shop without Super Famicom games. And Nintendo 64 as well. As you can see in the glass cabinet, it's full of Game Boy releases. No cases, of course. Well, they got cases. And of course we've got Sega Saturn. Some pretty good titles there. Hundreds of them as well. Door Dreamcast. And GameCube. Some classic arcade cabinets there with Neo Geo on, with some kids' homework on it. <laughs> and the PlayStation 2 releases. <laughs> and over here we got all the player's guides. So let's go and have an interview with the owner. This is Hideo. He is the owner of this Famicom shop and he's been very kind and uh, he's going to do an interview with us for the Retro Corp. So let's ask him a few questions. 
<laughs> what type of games do Japanese people like? Ah, horse racing simulation, I see. And um, Metro Core is a retro based game show. Uh, can you tell me what was the first hardware you ever got? Famicom to PC. Ah, Famicom and PC Engine, Nintendo Entertainment System. Okay. Um, what was, what's your favorite game on the PlayStation? Derby Stadium 98. Ah, Derby Stadium 98. Uh, horse racing game? Yes. Ah, okay. Uh, what, what's the average age of a Japanese gamer? Ah, about 25 years old. Oh, older than England. Uh, many people think that retro games are more fun than modern games. What do you think? Ah, in Japan, um, only mostly maniacs are into retro game and um, the average gamer has, likes his new games. Yeah, okay. Uh, do you have a special message for the Western gamer? Ah, um, he'd like you to play um, Japanese role-play games since uh, they are the best ones and uh, it's pretty difficult to play them in Japanese but he'd like you all to uh, try and play Japanese RPGs ah, Thank you very much, thank you. you're welcome
Ha, ha, ha. It's actually right, you stupid old fires. Oh man, look what you done. Nom nom nom. I love this chicken. Oh father, get up you useless fuck. I didn't do anything. All I did was hit him. Not my problem, he's a fag. And if you haven't guessed by now, this is her Enter Hero for the Sega Dreamcast. Sega's comical and very good RPG. Well, action RPG, I should say. <clears throat> Made using the exact same uh, engine, or if not the exact same, a very similar engine to that used in um, the Sega arcade game Spike Out. You may have heard of Event Hero before it came to the uh, Dreamcast. It was actually a Mega Drive game. Uh, this Dreamcast conversion is actually a conversion of the Mega Drive version. And it's uh, pretty much identical in every way to the Mega Drive version. Except for obviously the uh, graphical update. So what you actually do in to Hero, apart from wandering around aimlessly trying to find stuff, well, the main point of the uh, game is uh, you actually rent yourself out as uh, some sort of part-time superhero. Who is rent a hero? Oops, just found a mini BMU game there. Don't want that. And um, it's your job to go and uh, sort of be a, I don't know, best described as a vigilante, I guess. We got the dirty old geezer from before, who actually works for the undercover agency Seca. And what he does now is he gives you a brand new console, which is actually a um, 128 bit Mega Drive or something. We've got our new console there. We can get a close up of it. Uh, unfortunately, there's no camera button, so I can't really get a good close up. But uh, let's go and plug it in and see what happens. Ah, oh, 
Creamcast. So, uh, via this, um, <coughs> artificial, uh, console built into the game, you can, uh, receive emails from various people throughout the game, and through these emails you can find yourself jobs or whatever. They also give you, like, little information and tips on how to, uh, do special moves and so on. There's all sorts of, uh, stuff in there. You can also uh, save and load from here. This is the job page. Find yourself a job. So let's go outside. The actual playing area of this game is actually is very large indeed, and there are quite a number of different places you can actually go. You have to get the subway there. Now I was actually going to show you near the end of the game, when um, your character is all uh, powered up. Unfortunately I've lost my bloody save file, I haven't got a clue where it's gone. So to become uh, our hero, which is a Venter hero, just a quick press of the button here. And he'll do his little uh, move there. Every time he changes, he does a little maneuver. So let's go and see where the problem is. There's a special guest who you might know. Now, who's that? They can't be saying I sent out Shiro, can they? Could well be him. Actually, later on in the game, you have to kick the crap out of him. Or more like he kicks the crap out of, out of you. Oop, nice bit of advertising there for Sanyo. Looks like trouble ahead. Let's go and see what's going to happen. Showed me, didn't it? Let's kick his ass. Always saying that he can be a superhero too. She's probably just saying, You can't be a superhero, you're just a prick. One of the nice things about uh, Rent Heroes the more you play it, the more you can actually update your character. And the more powerful it gets, the more special moves he gains, such as uh, electric lightning bolts and so on. Unfortunately, you won't get to see them today. You have to play the game for quite some time to actually get all the saves and uh, all the powers. Oh, it looks like this punk means business. Time to his ass. So you can see at the top, we got a charge meter there. Unfortunately, I can't um, use it at the moment. Be at the beginning of the game, I don't have no special powers or anything like that. So it makes the game uh, quite different, quite dull at first. But like I said, the more the more you play it, the more uh, bonuses you get, and the, um, the better your suit becomes. Overall, uh, Rent Hero is actually a very, very funny uh, action RPG, which I'm sure you'll all love. Uh, the only problem is it's all in Japanese. Uh, 
there is actually a good a good player's guide for it over on um, GameFAQs. Just um, while they've got to complete another NAF forum. You do actually have some pretty good facts over there, so um, I suggest uh, you pick yourself up a copy of Enter Hero and um, check out the facts. GameFAQs.com. Of a bit of enter here, goodness. I do believe that the game was meant to be coming out on the Xbox in English in the States, but uh, that seems to have uh, disappeared now. So it looks like uh, the only 3D version of it, or update version, is uh, this uh, Dreamcast version. Looks like he's taking a dump there. So, um,. What sort of score are we going to give her, Venter Hero? Well, we're actually going to give it quite a good score. We should give it a good score around about 8 out of 10. It seems to be the average score in this uh, month's show. It's not a game you're going to finish overnight, it does last you a long time, and there's an awful lot to it. And Venter Hero look, runs like he's crapped his pants. And that's always good for entertainment value.